Greet three neighbors, say ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Praise God. Those of you that are joining us online, thank you. Again, share the link, push it forward so that everyone knows that Linked Up Church is on air. Praise God. Woo! All right. Good morning. Um, for those of you that might be first-time visitors, I am not the Pastor Joel Gregory. I'm the other Pastor Gregory, Trish Gregory. And if you want to receive an anointed word, you're going to get it today. But I invite you to come back when he's ministering, as well as just any of our staff members, and I know you will be blessed. So this morning we're talking about faith mentality. The faith mentality. Some time ago, almost, yes, 30 years ago. Ooh, 30 years ago <laughs> this year, I spent about 31 hours in jail. For no noble deed, mind you. I thought it was noble at the time, but for no noble deed, looking back. And you know, when you're in jail, at least, <laughs> not that any of you will ever be, um, but when I was there, you know, there was another lady that was there. I was sober, and I couldn't help but to ponder what had just happened, who my real friends were, where was I going, and what decisions did I have to make to change the trajectory of my life? And so I made some important decisions that night. And praise God, it's all behind me now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some, someone said, praise God. <laughs> but that's where Paul was when he wrote this letter to the Philippian church. Now, he was in jail for a noble deed. He was in jail for Christ, unlike me for laying hands on police officers. <laughs> but nevertheless, he's in jail now. He's in prison, as a matter of fact, for way longer than 31 hours. And he's finding himself really pondering and sharing what he deems to be some of the most important points for the church to have. And even though this is a very short letter, I believe that he was like, I ain't no time for playing games. I'm going to tell you what I need to tell you, repeat what I told you, and continue to enforce what I'm going to tell you some more. And so in Philippians chapter 3, I'll start at verse 12 from the Passion Translation. He says here, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing, but I run with passion into his, God's abundance, so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me, to make me his own. He says, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, these convictions, God will reveal it to them. And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize, following one path with one passion. Now, Paul, after sharing earlier in earlier letters and passages, he shares all his sufferings and all of the things that he's gone through for the cause of Christ. And now in this letter right beforehand, he just got through listing all of his accomplishments, all of his credentials, his great works. Paul, the apostle. Paul. The, the Greek, Paul. And so he now goes on to say, hey, I'm forgetting all about that stuff. And I'm focused exactly what's on in front, going on in front of me. And notice in this passage, he continuously talks about two eras. He talks a little bit about the past, but he talks a whole lot about the future. And that's what the faith mentality is. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Paul expresses what should be our attitude 
which is to run with passion into his abundance so that we may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of us to make me, us, his own. Our purpose is connected to our salvation. And our salvation is connected to our purpose. In other words, Paul is reminding us that Jesus died and rose again, ascended unto heaven so that we may walk in the freedom and fullness of the purpose for which we are to be. He's letting us know that when Jesus hung on that cross, took on those lashes, took on that beating, pierced on his side, took on those nails, died, went to hell for three days, rose again to make his point, and then rose on high, he says he, in that t- point of time, provided all of his abundance so that we can walk in the freedom and fullness of our purpose. Amen. 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 Jeremiah 29, 11, in the Amplified, it says, and most of you know this, for I know the plans and the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and well-being, and not for disaster, but to give you a future and a hope. which is why we have our next steps, right? Next steps two is exactly about you. It's not so much about linked up church, but it's about you. You find out how you're wired. You find out what your motivational gifts are. It's about you so to set, to set you on a course to fulfill what we believe are one of the four pillars of this church, connecting people to purpose. Amen. Because in that purpose is your joy fulfilled, In that purpose, do you have greater peace? In that purpose, are you glorifying God? In that purpose, are you now able to function at a greater level of faith? And all too often, people get caught up in, I don't know what my purpose is, because we want to associate purpose with a job description. Your purpose is who you are. You are going to show up in your righteous state every single time. And when you realize what that purpose is, then you are able to flourish. I don't care what your job description is. You could be a sanitation worker, but because you are natural at leading and you are natural at motivating people, you are an exhorter, that's going to show up. You could be a cook, but because you are an organizer and you are administratively gifted, you're going to have a whole system laid out so that anybody can walk in your kitchen and get it done. Right? It's not the cook that's made, walked into the purpose. It's the organizer that's walked into the job description of a cook that's manifested his purpose. You understand? And stop looking for your purpose to make you rich. Minister Kimberly says, say it one more time. Stop looking for your purpose to make you rich. It may happen. It may not. But you will be abundantly supplied. That's on account of his, who he is, right? So focusing on fulfilling God's purpose for our lives is optimum faith. His abundance is tied to his purpose for our lives. It is. We experience his abundance when we're walking in that. I cannot emphasize that enough. Now, our mindset is essential to the growth and development of our faith and patience. Our mindset, and that's what we're going to be talking about, is that mindset. Our mindset can deter or can accelerate us towards a manifestation based on the faith decisions that we make in the now. See, Paul's talking a little bit about the past, a whole lot about the future, but he's making the determination now. And in every moment, you have to decide right now whether I'm going to move forward or whether I'm going to stay stuck. And all too often, I see too many people being stuck in yesteryear, not moving forward. And then wondering, oftentimes when we end up in these cycles, it's because of what happened yesteryear and the default mindset that we have that causes us and invites us to end up in the same situation. 
Now, we learned already that mentally ascending does not equal faith. When Pastor Gregor was teaching during the 40 days of faith, we, he made it clear, we made it clear, to mentally ascend does not equal faith. You can go and find scripture, you can repeat it. I know people that can quote the books of the Bible right, left, up and down, backwards and forwards, and still aren't walking in what God has really called them to walk in. Still won't get on an airplane. Still run away from bugs. Still mad at whoever. So now we learned, however, on this faith journey towards God's manifestation, it involves a few behaviors. We talked about studying the word of God, right? Remember the juice, the juice that was up here? Who was here? Y'all better, I'm about to stand up. Everybody stand up. Stand up. Shake it off. Now sit down. What came after studying the word of God? You hush. Processing, right? Processing. After processing came what? They said juice. Yes, juice it did, but later, later. Confession. What we say contributes to our faith or can rob us on that journey of faith. And then lastly, we talked about patience. But in that processing, which is where we're going to park, what happens? Because it's so abstract. You know, yes, we confess the word of God. We meditate on the word of God. Joshua 1, 8 tells us that this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt what? Meditate on it day and night so that thou can do what? Observe to do, to do, to do, to do all that is written therein so that thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Who's going to make your way prosperous? God. Because there's enough power in his word to make you prosperous. So we're going to focus on that processing because that processing involves your mindset. There is a faith mindset that one has to adopt in order to walk in part of the manifestation. I say part like for real, for real. Because as soon as you think you've gotten a vision for your life, God's already promoted it. As soon as you think you got to promotion, he's already promoted that. Now, when I was a little girl, I had a vision for my life. When I'm telling you I'm living beyond the dream, now it's not perfect, but I'm living beyond the dream of that 9, 10, 11, 12, 18, 21-year-old girl, okay? Now, there are three mindset adoptions that we, we're going to talk about, and Paul does an excellent job making a synopsis right here in Philippians chapter 3. Number one. Realizing that our strength does not equal God's strength. Realizing that our strength does not equal God's strength. Number two, leaving the past behind. Leaving the past behind. Yes, leaving behind what he did to you. Leaving behind what she did to you. Leaving behind what they did to you. Right? And number three, being faithfully focused, being faithfully focused. Now, these mindsets will continue to feed your freedom and growth from the insecurities, the distractions, the unhealthy default behaviors that easily creep into our best intentions during our faith journey. So let's talk about them. Number one, Paul says, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. Paul says, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. We were never created to live life without God. That was in the garden, and that was especially so after the garden. Even more so since sin entered the earth. We were never created, never, ever, ever. We are forever connected to have this umbilical cord, this spiritual umbilical cord that connects us to God. Now, whether we receive the nutrition that comes through it is up to us. Zechariah 4, 6, he says, so he answered. Now, mind you, this is Zechariah prophesying the word of God to Zerubbabel. 
as he's going into a war that he believes is unwinnable. And then God tells him through Zechariah, and so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Yes. Proverbs talks about unless God builds the city, it cannot stand. I don't know what your plans might be. I don't know what your faith journey might be. And you may have earned several doctors, several masters, several accomplishments. You might know the president, the vice president, the governor, and the mayor. If God ain't in it, it's either accomplishable because of your own ambition, but it's going to destroy you, or it's not accomplishable. Period. When God calls you, he not only equips you, but he provides, he leads, and he instructs you. Yes. Scripture tells us how he ordered the steps of the righteous. Yes. You'll find yourself, people are oftentimes talking about, I don't know what step to take. I'm waiting for God to release me. Let me tell you something. Boo boo. God does not take three years to tell you to make a decision. Yes, that's right. Some of uh, the hell that we experience is because our, of our refusal to make a decision. Because the decision that we co are compelled to make, we have to make by faith. But we want a down payment. When God is telling you to just trust me, take the first step and I'll direct you, and you'll know when to take the next one. Take the next step, and I'll direct you on how to take the next one. He is not obligated to give you the big picture, nor is he obligated to give you a down payment. But he's obligated to respond to your faith. Pastor Gregory is quoted as saying, to not know the purpose of a creation inevitably leads to abuse. To not know the purpose of a creation inevitably leads to abuse. I want you to think about for a couple of seconds what it is that you do. What do you do if, you're, if you have a job, if you're at home? What is it that you do? And in the doing, what, do, what part of that doing do you delight in? In your doing, I don't care if you hate your job, but what aspect of your job has you working there? One, two, three, five, 10, 20 years. What aspect of your job compels you to show up? What delights you? What feeds you in that job? Therein is a part of your purpose. Therein is a part of your purpose. What I do, what Pastor Gregory and I love doing, he's a coach to the heart. He is a coach. That man loves to see, he loves to win, and he loves to see people winning. We both do. But he loves exhorting and, and encouraging and making sure that you are on the right track. My part of winning is I love for people to be informed. I love service. I love making sure that, listen, no matter what I did, I was a lifeguard, I was a medical office manager, I was an assistant manager in the, tech, in the x ray department of several hospitals. I, no matter what I did, I always got with the patient and helped them understand the process so that they were at ease going through the process, even the billing process. I always showed up for that part. Now, if you ask me to file, I don't want nothing to do with filing. You want me to do the paperwork? I'll do it, but really? Now, this is before computers, so you know. Those of you that date back, you had to write everything and swipe the credit cards, right? Now, when you're walking in your divine purpose, no matter how well you may be walking in it, you still need God. You still have to have Faith in God. Yes. No matter how well you walk in that purpose, 
because some of us have multifaceted purposes, right? But some of us can show up in multiple areas and delight in it. We do well in it. Now, there's this thing called ambition. That's human faith, human faith. I have faith that I can do it. It's real. And then there's mental ability, the determination, the knowledge, the wherewithal, the I can't be broke no more mentality. I ain't going back to that place no more. That equals ambition. What is ambition? Ambition is simply a strong desire to do or achieve something, typically requiring determination and or hard work. And ambition is cool. Ladies, you know, you meet a man, and he's talking about what are you going to do, but ambition is sexy. <laughs> yeah, I said it in the pulpit, ambition is sexy. And you lying if you don't think so. We love women, we love hearing about where he going, what he going to do, his dreams, and we're like, let's go, let's go. All right? Until we find out that it's just talk. Now, nothing's wrong with ambition. Many successes have been accomplished just by way of sheer ambition. I know many of Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, especially Jews, Christians, that have accomplished things not because of their faith in God, but because of their ambition. I know atheists and agnostics that have done the same. So ambition is real in the earth. Why? Because God has a law in the earth called seed, time, and harvest. It's irrevocable. It rains on the just and the unjust. It's going to happen. Which is why you can have someone who don't speak the language come to America, plant themselves, and become a millionaire after 10 years. Right? But when you add God to it, there's a supernatural acceleration and there's something that is beyond your ability that once you get there, you like, people ask you, how did I end up here? And what God wants you to say, God, he did it. I can't tell you how many times people have called us and asked us how did we, methods in ministry and what was our, our, our processes and how did we do what we do? And we cannot tell you how we did what we did, except that God brought the right people at the right time, and we ended up making the right decisions. And guess what, Linked Up? It's happening right now. It's happening right now. I can't talk about it all, but I'm seeing it unfold right now. And I'm telling you, God's vision, what he's given my husband and me, is so much bigger than what we can process in our own mind. It's so much bigger that it can be intimidating. But when you just trust God and allow him, just stay behind him and not get in front of him, and allow him to lead you, you'll find yourself in the land of the living, in the land of the wealthy, and not know how you got there. Some of you know, when you look back last year, and you committed your life to God, and you're like, I don't know how those bills got paid, but God. So now, Proverbs 10, 22 in the Passion, it says, true enrichment comes from blessing, the blessing of the Lord with rest and contentment and knowing that it all comes from him. The King James Version says that when God adds a blessing, he addeth no sorrow to it. What is the blessing? The blessing is the empowerment to prosper. God will empower you to prosper. He won't always drop a check in the mail. Praise God for the dismissal of student loans. Yes, Lord, praise God. I just happened to pay mine off way, way early, a long time ago, but praise God for that even more. But praise God for that. But he, he said, won't he do it? Is he all right? Yes, I know he's all right. It's all, that's a good thing. That's our personal cheer corner back there, boy. He knows. But, and, and, and that's an example. Minister Bernard, that man is gifted in praise and worship. Yeah. I 
I, pro I mean, I know I probably get on his nerves, but I've asked him to do many, th if, it's in if there's a musical note involved, I'm like, where, where, where Bernard at? Where Bernard at, right? Because I've had him do everything from DJing, to rapping, to remixing stuff. <laughs> and I'm like Mary with Jesus. When Jesus, when Mary said, well, the wine ran out, do something. He's like, woman, it's not my time. She's like, whatever he says to do, do it. <laughs> I'm like that with Minister Bernard. <laughs> He's like, I don't DJ. Well, whatever you put together, we're we going to do that. <laughs> right? But guess what? That's not it. Minister Bernard is great at administration. He is great at administration. He is. And so the, good, the, the one thing about that, though, if you're not careful, if he's not careful, his ambition and his ability and his nerdy curiosity and his competitive spirit could drive him in that lane and it wears him out. But when you step back and say, okay, God, anoint me to lead and direct, teach and instruct so that others, because I know what it looks like. I know what it sounds like so that I can now empower other people to walk in that as well. Now, that's where his purpose really shows up because your purpose doesn't show up in the doing. Your purpose shows up in the empowering other people to do the same and better. Number two, however, Paul says, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past. Ooh. Let's park right here. Let's have some fun right here. He says, Paul says, I forget all of the past. How much of the past? All. Now, that word forget isn't literally I don't remember. That forget is I don't rely on it. I don't ponder it. I don't count on it. That's what that forget is. So mind you, he earlier, we know about his suffering, shipwrecked, beaten, stoned. He was put in jail several times in shackles, right? But then he goes on to talk about all of his accomplishments, right? He's a Pharisee and of the line of the Jews, but yet he's a Greek citizen, all this here stuff. But then he says, I caught it all but dung. In other words, it's not just dirt, it's doo-doo. I'm violating all political correctness in the pulpit today. But that's what he's, I, that's not me, that's him. He said it, right? So, our history oftentimes invites us to be distracted from our faith journey because it's so easy to go back to our default settings. If you've ever had therapy, if you ever have spiritual or Christian or pastoral counseling, I know, when I do it, I know, let's talk a little bit about your family of origin. Let's talk a little bit about where you came from. Because where you came from, that family of origin, though love may have been very much there, though the best intentions may have been very much there, it still sculpted you in a way in which the enemy has been able to creep in, pervert it, and take you down a road that is not of God. And so let's talk about that family of origin. Some of you call those, th those, those things generational curses. I speak to that right now that they die in Jesus' name. Amen. For those who, let, who struggle with letting go of the past, the past pain, the past regret, now you can feel trapped by your situation and unable to move forward in your lives. That's what ends up happening. That default setting causes you to make decisions and to act in a behavior that's number one, not faith-filled. Number two, because not all of it is dramatically toxic. Not all of it is drug abuse. Not all of it is drug, uh, alcoholism. Not all of it is Theft. Now, all of it is pornography. Some of it, it may be white lies. How many of you? <laughs> Mama, I love you. 
But you know, when the bill collector called, <laughs> my mother was quick to say, answer the phone. If it's somebody say they want to speak to, you know, to say their formal names, John Davenport. If they say our last name, just say, she not here or he not here. <laughs> I'm nine, 10 years old. How many of you know you're teaching white lies? White lies become dark lies. And let me tell you, if I got in trouble, I was the master of making up a situation. I would lie. I, oh, I would lie. And some of my lies were convincing, too. I got away with some of it. But then, after a while, you know, I become born again, and someone says, how are you doing? And I say, fine, and I'm not fine. Someone says, how do you like my food? And I say, oh, it's good. It ain't really good. <laughs> he said, that's a white lie. But it's still a lie, right? Listen to this. This is an excerpt from an article uh, called Psych Central. The name of the article was Healing from the Past and Living in Your Present. For those who struggle with letting go of the past pain or regret, they can feel trapped by their situation and unable to move forward in their lives, feeling unable to let go of the past that can lead to clinical depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, or even suicide. Depression and anxiety are the number one diagnosed mental illness situations of the day. And guess what? The church is of no exemption. Now, I'm not minimizing anyone's depression, but oftentimes we relate situational depression to a long-term type of depression to the point that it becomes clinical. Not because of something that, you know, that's ongoing or because of a severe mental condition as much as because we stay stuck in what happened and we realize we can't control what might happen. And because we spend too much time Focus on what might happen because of what did happen. We're in this here roller coaster ride that we can no longer control and it's racking our brains. Luke chapter 9, verse 62 in the American Standard Version says, But Jesus said unto him, No man, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No man, I didn't say it, Jesus said it, it's red. No man is fit for the kingdom of God while putting his hand to a plow and looking back. What's the kingdom of God? He's not talking about he's not fit for heaven. He's saying he's not fit. He cannot walk in doing God's things, God's ways. He can't. He can't. You cannot look back while trying to move forward and think for a moment. I don't care how, how straight you put your feet. Where you're looking is where you will eventually go. I did prayer a few weeks ago, and I was talking about me being on my motorcycle. And one of the things that I had to master, the reason why I wanted that motorcycle was so bad, because I loved, I loved the way taking curves looked until I got on that bad boy. <laughs> then I was like, oh, I feel like I'm about to touch the ground. And I had to master these curves. And so uh, it took some time. My instructor told me, my husband told me, but it wasn't until one of my sisters on the ride connected group told me, Ms. T, I think it was Miss T that told me this, that she, and she said the exact same thing. My instructor told me that if I'm looking to where I'm going instead of where I'm at, I'll do the curves fine. And I come to this corner and it's a one lane, I'm, tr I'm turning right off of one lane into a another one lane, and there's a big old 18-wheel semi-truck right there in the left-hand turn lane. And I'm at a stop. And I'm like, oh, okay. And my heart is racing. I'm experiencing anxiety in that moment. But I remember what was said to me. So I continued to look at where I was going instead of trying to miss the truck. And I missed the truck and got to where I was going. I had to make that adjustment, right? Oftentimes, it's very subtle because we are living in a culture where no one, so, so distrust is the real pandemic. Yes, yes, yes. Distrust is the real pandemic. And I'm going to submit this to you because it is because we put more trust in man than we did in God. 
Nothing's wrong with trusting in man. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But when we trust what someone said or we, when we rely too much on what, when we put someone on a pedestal, pedestal and we take God off of it, we remove God's ability to keep our hearts, to hear him instruct, and to walk in his wisdom. And so now we have this pandemic of distrust going on right now, where now we, even when someone puts an open book of the word of God, all powerful, into your hands and before you, our opinions matter more than what the word of God says, because our opinions are formed from hurts, and our hurts are dictating where we're going to go, or our flesh. Okay? So say, I will, I will. Move, forward move forward and not depend on, not depend on. What, happened what happened yesterday, yesterday. Last, month, last month, last year, last, year. last decade, last and definitely BC. Yes. Some of y'all like, what's, y'all just saying stuff, don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> BC, before Christ. Now, you know, when I was, you know, thought I was saved, not really saved, unsaved, heathen, a fool. That's what I was. I mean, like for real, on a rocket ship with jet fuel, heading straight for hell. I thought, you know, and then I got saved. And I'll go to the, some of the, you know, church. This is back then, and this is not necessarily the church I came from recently. But I would go to little church events trying to, you know, live this saved life and do the right thing, right? And I'd be sitting there like, this is boring. <laughs> hey, this ain't fun. Now, I don't have to drink. I don't have to cuss, but I could at least be like, <laughs> go have some fun. <laughs> What's... <laughs> I don't dance, but I'm trying, right? Because I thought that life was fun. Listen to what Ecclesiastes says. This is Solomon in all his wisdom in chapter 7, verse 10. And the Amplified, he says, Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. Why were the old days better than these? And some of you, you, you already know. Some of you are dragging the old days right on into today. Right? But see, Christianity doesn't always mean... Jesus, singing songs of Jesus. I mean, I'm not trying to have a date night with my husband listening to Tasha Cobbs. I'm going to look into them dreamy eyes and be like, yeah, baby, what's up? And Tasha Cobbs is not putting me in that mood. Right? I, I, I enjoy dancing for the Lord. But I enjoy grabbing them shoulders and rocking with my boo, right? I can go to a football game and have a good old time even though everyone around me is drunk. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 in the New Living Translation, it says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. He goes on to talk about, he goes on to to say, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. In other words, I'm going to paraphrase it to move on with time. He says, we don't fight like we used to fight. We don't party like we used to party, but we still party, but we don't fight like we used to fight. Because the fighting is in our mindset. When we realize that people that are operating down here and God, Colossians chapter 3, has called us to see things from his point of view, then we now have the authority and can walk in the authority and the freedom of saying, you know what? That ain't me. We can walk in the authority of asking, why do you do what you do? We can walk in the authority to just turn away from what other people are trying to do to drag us down. Let's talk about this a little bit. A biblical example, which was so good to me, and it's often overlooked. And we got so many people that haven't really spe- spent a lot of time in the Bible. I want to spend some time here. He says here in Genesis chapter 19, this is right after Abraham has prayed to God, and God has said, I'm going to destroy this wicked, wicked city called Sodom and the Gom- Gomorrah. And he goes on to talk about how I'm going to do this no matter what. See, God will tell you what he's going to do, and it might not be pretty. 
He might have told you and led you to believe, uh, yeah, there, you might, there might be a layoff. I knew when we got fired that something bad was going to happen. I knew it so much so I called my girlfriend. I said, hey, I mean, today is a day, but I'm not feeling good about it. And she was like, you know what? Y'all have done everything. You've accomplished a lot, and it's going to be good. It's going to be just fine. Promotion is on the horizon. And my husband was so high expecting promotion. In fact, he had posted that, day, that, that morning that this is going to be the greatest day ever. Now, it was, but not in the way in which he expected. But me as his wife didn't want to do anything to dash my faith, his faith. So I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe I'm not right. Maybe I'm wrong. But I just had this here, uh. And it happened, but praise God, because here I am today. So Holy Spirit will lead you even if it's not so good. But in Genesis chapter 19, now God, Abraham convinced God to save Lot, his nephew, Lot and his family. And God says, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So right before he's going to do what he goes, is going to do, he sends the angels, messengers, to warn Lot. In verse, chapter 19, verse 17 in, in the book of Genesis, it says, When they had brought them outside, one of the angels said to Lot, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you or stop anywhere in the entire valley. He goes on to say, Escape to the mountains of Moab or you will be consumed and swept away. Drop down to verse 23, he goes on to say, And the sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. And then the Lord rained down brimstone, flaming sulfur, and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. But his Lot's wife, whoa, these wives not giving us a good name. She lingers behind, foolishly, longingly looking back towards Sodom in an act of disobedience, and she became a pillar of salt. Lot's wife not only looked back, but she lingered behind. She lingered behind. The angel said, just keep your eyes locked on where you're going. Don't look back. But she not only not looked forward, but she looked back and she lingered behind. In the commentary, the scholars say that she lingered behind and perhaps turned to salt because they, this happened right by the Dead Sea. And she became the essence of what she was leaving behind. She became the essence of what she was leaving behind. Last thing I'm going to talk about, mercy is mandatory. Mercy is mandatory. You have to forgive. You have to express mercy. You have to. Luke chapter 17, verse 36, all the notes are in the YouVersion Bible app, and you can go back there, and I encourage you to study this. It says, be alert if you see your friend doing wrong. Jesus is talking to them. Correct him. If he responds, forgive him, even if it's personal against you, and repeat it seven times through the day. And seven times he says, I'm sorry, and I won't do it again. Forgive him. The apostles came and said to the master, give us more faith then. He said, give us more faith. They go on to say, but the master said, you don't need more faith. There is no more or no less in faith. If you have the bare kernel of faith and say to a size, the size of a poppy seed, you could say to the sycamore tree, go, jump in a lake, and it would do it. Jesus let them know that you have to forgive because the very last, some of the last words that he said on that cross was what? Forgive them for they know not what they do. The whole point of that cross was to take on their sin and to express and display mercy to a people that had rejected him. And every time you make a decision to look back and not forward, and to stay in unforgiveness, you are rejecting him. You're not rejecting the one that wronged you. You are utterly rejecting him and restricting his ability to move in your life. Restricting his ability to move in your life. So we sing, you're the God of miracles, signs and wonders. We believe it. That's a nice song. 
Well, Nard, you know I can't go without singing some. <laughs> and so when we do that, we limit God's ability so we can pray all day long. But if we can't forgive the father that didn't show up, the mother that abandoned us, the ex-husband or the ex-wife that's not doing something, oh, yet, yeah, better yet, the husband or the wife that did something that you never recovered from, then we limit God's ability to move in our lives. So mercy is mandatory. This is all in that processing that I was talking about. Changing your mindset. Understand that when you have a faith mentality, you are thinking and believing that what God said, he can do it. And not only can he do it, he wants to do it. So my mindset, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot accept failure. For me, failure is just another step. It's called education. I have learned to turn my failures into education and learn from them and go back at it again. Let's end right here. I'm going to repeat it to you, but I'm going to repeat it to you from the King James Version. The conclusion is this. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 13, he says, let me get to it first. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind me, and I press. She say, he says, I press towards, the, I'm reaching for, uh, I'm sorry, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize for the, of the calling of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. He says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if anything we be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even unto you. Now, quickly, I'm reminded of this woman with an issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. So really quickly, Minister Bernard, Duwani, uh, Minister Johnny, Minister David, no, Minister Russell, because you ain't got nothing in your hand. Come up here real fast. All right, Clayton, you back there, come over here. So now, really quickly, in Mark chapter 5, and there are several versions of it. Now, they don't know what I'm about to do. This woman had, be stri had been stricken with an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, once before, my husband used you as Jesus, so you're going to be Jesus again. Okay. okay? So this is what's called a tallit. This tallit came all the way from Israel. It's a short one, but rabbis wore a long one, right? Because on this tallit hangs various strands, and all these strands represent all of the promises of God. All these strands represent the covenants that God has made towards his people, right? And when Jesus, as a rabbi, wore it, it's actually hung all the way down to the ground. But since you're Jesus... And I'm not Jesus, and I couldn't buy Jesus' cloak, uh, prayer shawl. You're just going to have the short one, right? So this is Jesus. So let's put Jesus in the middle. Y'all step back a little bit. Now, Jesus and his apostles, they're walking. So y'all walk around Jesus, right? And crowd, and crowd around him. Crowd, you're protecting him. You're his MODs, right? And here I am, this woman. Number one, as a woman, I'm not supposed to be in the company of men. Number two, I'm bleeding, so I'm unclean. I'm not even supposed to be around people. But see, this woman, she heard that this man called Jesus, this man called Jesus, this man called Jesus, he heals, he delivers, he's set free. And I've been bound up with blood. I've been bound up with sacrifice. I've been bound up with pain. I've been bound up with distraction. I've been bound up with embarrassment. I've been bound up with society things. I've been bound up by the law for too long. And no one else had my cure. I spent my money on physicians. I spent my money on sayers. I spent my time at pools, but it's not happening for me. I've exhausted all of my options. But she hears that this man, Jesus, is in town. And she sees him in the throne. She's like, this is my chance. This is my chance. This is my chance. And she breaks through the crowds. And she breaks through the men. And she breaks through those priests. And she breaks through the Pharisees. Y'all supposed to, I, I can touch them. Y'all supposed to stop me from touching them. And then he says, she, they, she, she busts through. She busts through. And she says, if I'm able to touch the hem of this garment, I may be healed. And
and she makes it and she touches the hem of his garment. Mind you, when you bleeding for 12 years, you ain't standing up against men over six feet tall. I don't know how tall they were. But she, I mean, I'm sweating. Whew. Thank you, gentlemen. She breaks through and receives her healing. Because in that moment, that's all she wanted. But because of the goodness of God and her pursuit of his promises, her pursuit of his purpose, her pursuit of his abundance, she said, this ain't getting away from me. And she presses. She presses past all that will hold her back to get what he got for her. So I dare you to walk in his purpose, to change your mindset. It means abandoning the decision-making process that so easily besets you. Some of you just are stuck on decisions that you can figure out. I dare you this week to make a decision that's beyond what you would normally do. Instead of getting mad when they do something, just say, baby, I love you. Somebody, somebody over here laughing. But make a faith decision and see God meet you exactly where you are. Yeah. Now, as we prepare for this final part, God has provided an abundance. God has given you a purpose, whether you're online or you're here in the sanctuary where everyone's in an attitude of prayer. God has supplied you, gifted you, anointed you, to walk in what he's put you in the earth to do. But you can't fully walk in that without knowing him, without submitting to him as Lord and Savior. Lord meaning master, Lord meaning boss, Lord meaning the one who I serve, the Lord meaning the one who I desire to please. See, I'm not interested, God's not interested in apologetic mentalities. He's not interested in emotional decisions. He's interested in faith decisions that come with conversion. So if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you haven't said, God, I surrender to you. I want to invite you to come and let's pray about it. Let's pray and receive him. Or perhaps you've been born again and I submit to you, even though you might be cutting up right now, you're still a believer. It's just that you've lived life contrary. You're not acting like it. So maybe you want to commit yourself once and for all. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Some people call it being backslidden. We call it being out of fellowship. And if that's you, I would love to pray with and for you. Or, you know, there's a secret weapon. There's this power that we have. And it enables us to know and walk in his purpose and to be free. Because it's a form of meditation. It's praying that un in that unknown language. And that's being baptized with the Holy Spirit with the physical evidence of speaking in tongues. And if you haven't received that, I would love to pray with and for you. And there are ministers here that will minister that to you if you're ready to receive. And finally, perhaps you haven't been planted in a church home. You've been wandering from church to church or you've just been surfing online, looking at all different types of church shows, but haven't planted anywhere. Pastor Gregory and I, we will be honored to receive you, serve you as pastors. We can promise you that you will always be taught the word of God, because that's what empowers you to live your best life. We pray for you daily, and we are committed and called to your success. So if any of that applies to you, while every head is bowed, while every heart is praying right now. No one's moving, walking, or talking unless they're assigned to do so. If that's you, you're saying, perhaps, God, I believe in you, but I haven't made a real decision for you. If that's you, I would want you to raise your hand right now. And you want to say once and for all, God, 
I want to know for sure in the word of God that you are Lord and Savior. I want to see my identification card in your word whereby I am sure of my salvation. Or perhaps you've been living life like I was, just buck wild. You've been living life contrary to the word of God. You know you're wrong. You know you get up and you make decisions that are wrong throughout your day. You know that you have no regard for Christ, but you know now that you need that. You need him. And you want to rededicate your life. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Praise God. Or perhaps you're one of those people that, I haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to learn more about being baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the Bible evidence of speaking in tongues. It's not spooky. It's not something that he comes and possesses you and makes you do it. He's a gentleman. But see, the enlightenment and the revelation of his word makes it easy to receive. And if that's you, I'd love to pray with and for you. And finally, if you want to make Linked Up Church your church home, we would love to receive you. So if any of those four invitations apply to you, would you please lift your hand high in the air to know that, so that I know I'm praying with and for you. I see this hand over here. Praise God, these two hands over here. Is there anyone else in the sanctuary? Praise God. I see this hand right down the middle. Praise God. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask in a moment that everyone stands up. And when they stand up, I'm going to ask you to take a bold step for Christ, just as he took a bold step for you. Gather up your belongings. Make your way down to this aisle. I want to hug your neck, and I want to do exactly what I said I was going to do. I want to pray with and for you. So congregation, would you please stand, and let's cheer and encourage those that did raise their hand or didn't raise their hand, but they know they should have, to come on down now in Jesus' name. to you. I don't know what you came down here, but we're going to redesignate today, September the what, 17th, as your spiritual birthday, all right? So if you would, lift one hand to the great high priest, Jesus Christ, and let's make this confession together. Repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died for my sins. He rose again restoring me to righteousness. He reigns, therefore I reign. Jesus, come into your, my heart. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. And all my sins are now forgiven. What's in the past is in the past. And I fasten myself to what's ahead. I thank you for it. And now declare that I am right with God in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I'm going to serve you notice. Never believe the word of a preacher if they can't show it to you in the word of God. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take you to a room and keep you just for a little bit of time. We have Gregory right here. He's going to take you back and show you exactly from the Word of God why you came down here, minister to you, and then so that you can have some clarity on what just happened. All right? God bless you. Go with him now in Jesus' name. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Now I have the privilege to, oh, those of you that are, I'm sorry. Let me make sure I do this. Those of you that, they're, you know, I'm that person, I was that person that didn't raise my hand and didn't come down, but I know I wanted to. We've made provision for you. 
in the seat pocket in front of you, there's what's called a connect card. If you want to receive salvation, rededication, a baptism of the Holy Spirit, or become a member of Leafed Up Church, please fill out this card and drop it in the offer receptacle when it goes by later on during offering time. To make it quicker, we've also provided a QR code. You could just hover over that QR code and fill out this card digitally. And a minister will follow up with you within the next week to minister to you and to answer the questions that you may have. So if that's you, please do that. If you're online, we did not leave you out. There's a prompt that allows you to fill out this card as well. If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you rededicated or you want to learn more about the baptism of Holy Spirit or being a member, we got you covered. So please be sure to complete that card online as well. Or you could simply just let you know, let us know that you have received Jesus on today. All right, that is it. Now, I have the privilege to announce it is offering time. It is worship time. Thank you so much for watching our online service. We certainly don't take that for granted. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to get connected with us, we encourage you to become a part of our online community. That's right. And you can do that by subscribing to our YouTube channel, sharing this video with a friend and following us on social media. Don't forget to meet us right here on this channel every Sunday for our services. If you desire to help us reach more people just like yourself and advance the kingdom of God, then click the Give button now. This will allow us to connect more people to God, their families, their purpose, and their communities. Thank you again for watching our service on today, and we'll, we'll see, see you next week. week.